Appreciate it very much. We do appreciate very much the invitation to come this week. We've been looking forward to it and I've been praying for these services, been praying for um, pray for your church. As he said, you know, throughout the week, it's possible that, you know, visitors come in from time to time. We've got some here tonight we're thankful for, but uh, we've come in, in hopes to be a blessing to New Testament Baptist Church. Amen. It's been our, our desire. It's been our prayer. And, and Brother Lafferty's right. It, it'd be hard, you know, for our generation that's not seen revival. It's really hard for us to even define what it is. Right. Uh, you know, having not seen it. Uh, one thing we know about ourselves is the generations kind of roll on seems like we're doing the opposite of what we should be um, right seems like our our tent pegs are getting hammered in a little deeper right into this world um yeah we, lo we love it mm -hmm. we love this You're world right. um this is temporary this isn't home this, Amen. Is, this isn't where we're going right. um, i hope tonight this in this uh first message tonight we, we could be encouraged and challenged to turn loose Amen. Turn loose to some of those things. I want to talk about Pharaoh this evening. Turn to Exodus chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5. We'll read the first two verses. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Mm. We're all familiar with the Exodus. Uh, when I read chapters 5 through 12 in this book, I'm always amazed at Pharaoh. Uh, you know what I think about when I think about Pharaoh? I think about Yul Brenner. <laughs> Honestly, has anybody seen that old movie, the, the Ten Commandments in the movie? So, so I've seen that before, and it's that that picture, kind of a Pharaoh, is kind of etched in my mind. But you know, if you actually read about Pharaoh, while everything around him falls apart, he will not let go. Right. Our message tonight: Why is it so hard to let go? Right. Why is it so hard to let go? Now, we can look at it easily with Pharaoh. We can look at it easily in each other, but maybe even in our own selves we can see why is it so hard to let go of, of sin, of bitterness, of grudges, of addictions, of attitudes, of hurt feelings? Why is it so hard to admit that we're wrong, to confess sin, to swallow pride? Why, why is it so hard to let go? Fill in the blank of what it would mean to you to let go. There's probably many reasons, but tonight I'd like to look at three. I'm primarily looking at Pharaoh as our example. Why is it so hard to let go? Number one, it's a control thing. Right. It's a control thing. Verse number two, who is the Lord? Hmm. You know, Moses came to him in verse one and said that the Lord God of Israel said, let my people go. Well, well who's the Lord? You know, Pharaoh had many gods, but who's, who's, Je who's this Jehovah? Right. This Yahweh. I don't know him. And I'm not going to obey his voice. Now listen, Moses. That's fine for you wandering out in the desert and tending the sheep. That's fine for you in Jethro's tent. But here in Egypt, I'm in charge. Mm -hmm. I'm in command. Uh, I'm king. I don't know who your Lord is, but around here I call the shots. And I'm saying I'm not letting these people go. Right. Pharaoh lived by that creed. That he was in charge. And that no matter what, he would be calling the shots. He would be the one that would have control in each and every situation. Look here in Exodus chapter 3, just back a page. Here was the Lord's exact command. Exodus 3 and verse 18 says, They shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. And you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us, and now let us go. We beseech three, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Let my people go. The Lord has told us that we're getting out of Egypt for a little while. We're going to take ours and we're going to go and sacrifice. We're going to journey three days journey into the wilderness. We're going to make sacrifice to our God. And he has said, let us go. Do you don't have to say here, Moses? I decide what goes on here. I'm not letting the people go. The slaves are mine. You make my bricks. You do my work. I'll decide the terms. I'll decide... Who goes? 
I'll decide what goes on. And you know, as the chapters roll on and as the plagues begin to hit Egypt, uh, there are some things that are somewhat troubling to Pharaoh, but never troubling enough to see him let go of control. Right. Never troubling enough to see him yield or to see him ease in any sort of way. Let's look at a couple passages. Exodus chapter 8. You see, it's not he's not going to let Israel go unless he gets to dictate the terms. Unless he gets to have a say in the details. Now, what was God's command? You go... You go three days' journey into the wilderness. Exodus chapter 8 and verse number 25. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye sacrifice to your God in the land. Now, is that the way God had said it? No. God had said three days' journey into the wilderness. Pharaoh says, All right, all right, all right. I'm going to let you guys sacrifice, but you have to sacrifice in the land. You see what Pharaoh's doing there? He will not give up control. Right. He will have the say. He will dictate the terms. Go ahead, sacrifice. And it looks like he's compromising. Or at least that he wants Moses and Aaron to compromise. That's it. Amen. We'll just go and sacrifice in the land. Well, what about verse 28? And Pharaoh said... Okay, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you shall not go very far away and treat for me. Okay, all right. Let's find some common ground. Let's compromise here a little bit. I'm going to let you go. I'm even going to let you go beyond the outskirts of the town, but not that far. Three days journey, not very far away. And while he appears to compromise again, he's looking to dictate the terms. Right. Amen. Chapter 10, look at verse number 8. Chapter 10, verse 8 says, Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh. Now we've seen some, some plagues, right? And he said unto them, Go, serve the Lord your God, but who are they that shall go? And Moses said, We'll go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds will we go, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. And he said unto them, Let the Lord be so with you, as I will let you go. And your little ones, look to it, for evil is before you. Not so. Go now, ye that are men, and serve the Lord, for that ye did desire. All right, I'm going to let you go. And I'm going to let you go your three days journey into the wilderness. But who, who, who did you say was going to go? All of us. We're all going. That's not really a good idea. You know, evil is around. How about just you that are men? You go out and serve. You know, the devil would be just fine with us doing our thing as long as he got them kids that are back. Right. There. You know, we can come here tonight. We can come here all week. We can play this game. We can do what, we, what we're doing. But if it's not real and it doesn't become real to our kids, what, what have we gained? Amen. What, what have we won there? And the devil is fine with that. You go. You serve. You sacrifice. But you leave them kids here. You leave them young ones here. And once more in verse number 24, chapter 10, verse 24, it says, Pharaoh called them to Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. And he says, Okay, go, take your kids, but leave your flocks behind. And you know why? Because if this stays behind, right. they'll come back. Yep. Amen. And how we are, wherever this is, that's where we'll come back to. Amen. You go. You go your three days journey. You even take those kids. But you leave, you leave behind those flocks. You leave behind those herds. Until the very end, even with plague after plague after plague, he will not totally let them go. He won't allow Moses or God to set the terms. He has to be the one until the very end that is exercising control. He won't yield. He won't forfeit. He won't give up. He will not relinquish any ounce of control. He wants to be the one that at the end of the day says, see, they only went as far as I told them they could. Right. They only went, they only took who I said they could take. They only went as far. They only sacrificed when and where I said that they could. It's all about control. Yep. And it's the same way for us. You know why it's hard to let go? You know why it's hard to let go of this world? Why the, the things of the world, the love that we have for the world, the sin, the addictions, the bitterness, the strife, the pride, the anger. 
You know why all of those things are hard to let go? It's a control thing. Amen. You're right. It's control. I mean, truly, now we look at us instead of Pharaoh. Why is it that we as God's people struggle to completely yield our will, our mind, and our control to the Lord? I'd lose my attitude if. I'd be more faithful if. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't be so bitter if. You know what that is? That's us still trying to exercise control. Amen. That's right. an unwillingness to yield, to forfeit, and to surrender. Amen. Not willing to give up control. We are still trying to call the shots. Well, I'd get right if so-and-so did. Right. Or I'd do this. I'd be more faithful and I'd get involved in this over here if. You know, well, if there's an if, then, then it's still up to you then, isn't it? You're still the one. We are still the ones that love to control and to call the shots. There's, there's this part of us that struggles to yield and to let go. When I worked at the factory in Missouri there, uh, I had a man that worked for me, and his name was Donald King. I remember this guy like it was yesterday. <laughs> um, I was in charge of shipping and receiving, and I, I was responsible to kind of give everybody their daily assignments. This guy would never do something because I told him to do it. If I gave him an assignment in the morning, he would go about doing six or seven other things. Now, eventually, late in the afternoon, he finally get to the thing that I told him to do. But he did it that way so that I'd know he did it when he wanted to. He did it on his own terms. And he wasn't going to do it because I told him to do it. Right. Now, we're that way, aren't we? Amen. I can see it in people. It's hard to see it in me. An unwillingness to yield. Turn to the book of Romans, chapter number 6. You know, our desire as Christians ought to be that we would live a life that's yielded to the Holy Spirit, yielded to that influence, to His witness, to His, uh, to, to His role in our lives, yielded to the Word of God, yielded to the commands of the Lord. Now, even if you never go above and beyond as a Christian, here's one thing that Paul wants you to do. Romans chapter 6 and verse 19. Romans 6 verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Mm -hmm. For as you have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. Amen. You know what Paul's saying there? He's saying, you know, there was a time you didn't have any trouble yielding. You remember what it's like to be lost? You remember when you were lost in sin and how it was nothing for us to yield ourselves, to yield our members to uncleanness, iniquity upon iniquity. You know what Paul says about yielding? He says, why don't you just try to be as yielding a saved person as you were as yielding a lost person? Why don't you just try to be as good a believer as you were a lost person? Because there was a time, he's saying, when you were lost, you didn't have any trouble yielding. You yielded, and you yielded. Iniquity, unto iniquity. You yielded your members as servants of unrighteousness. See, why don't you just do the same now? Right. Why don't you just yield your members servants to holiness? Amen. And to righteousness and to cleanness? Well, why is it now, all of a sudden, now we're bucking at it? Why is it now that, that even though we have the Holy Spirit of God that lives within us, even though we've been made alive, we've been changed, we're new creatures, old things have passed away, now all of a sudden, now, now we've got trouble yielding. Now we don't want to yield to Christ. There's still that part of this nature and that flesh that just bucks at it, it fights at it. I, I, I don't want to let go. You know why it's so hard to let go? I don't want to. Yep. It's a control thing. I like to set the terms. I like to be the one in control. I want to dictate what I do and when I do it. And there's still part of me that struggles to yield, to let go. Right. It's a willingness. It's really a control thing. I'm just like Pharaoh. And until the very end, I'm going to try and hold on to whatever authority, to whatever control I can of my life. As ye have yielded, we should also yield. Our desire should be to submit, to yield. Here you have a man like Pharaoh who's been told what to do. He's been told by the Lord what to do. He's been told by Moses what to do. And yet four different times, he's kept trying to move the bar. Mm -hmm. He's kept trying to move, just trying to set the terms. Mm -hmm. Trying to the very end to dictate what he's going to do. Turn back to our text. And let's look at Exodus chapter 8 again. Exodus 8. 
There's no more pitiful scenario of this than what it says in chapter 8, verse 8. They even wrote a funny song about this. Exodus chapter 8, verse 8. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people. And I'll let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me. When shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses that they may remain in the river only? Moses, you got to do something. you got to get these frogs out of here. It's done. You, you, you say the word and I'll get them out of here. They'll be gone. When do you want them gone? Verse 10. And he said, tomorrow. <laughs> right. Is that not the silliest thing you've ever heard? You've all heard the, right, you've all heard the old song, One More Night with the Frogs. <laughs> what kind of idiot would say anything other than, get rid of them now. <laughs> right now. But there was something that, that Pharaoh knew. He knew even now. He could exercise a little control. And to prove that he was not going to relinquish control at all tomorrow. Mm. We'll do this tomorrow. Until the very end, he, he kept suffering and kept his people suffering just so that he could prove one more time. Right. I have the say. I have the final word. I'm in control here. Just to show that he was unbreakable, he would rather go the hard way than just yield, than just submit, than just let go of his stubbornness. Why do we have to be so stubborn? Why, why, why won't we just let go? I mean, why are we so stubborn? Why do we have to have so much control? Why do we have to have such a tight grip in this world? Why won't we relinquish some control? Why won't we just let some things go? And what are you holding on to anyway? Right. Let, let some of these things go. Psalm chapter 26. Psalm 26, verse 26. Psalm 26, David says it this way in verse 2. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins in my heart. Lord, you take the reins. You take control. And David there is showing his willingness not only to submit, but David wants to see where he's at with the Lord. Lord, I want you to try the reins because, you know, he wanted the Lord to pull a little bit and see, you know, if the Lord pulls, how hard does he have to pull before I listen? How hard does he have to pull before I learn this lesson? You know, it, it, a well-trained horse, what is it? It's just a slight tug, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a slight tug and it goes. Now, horse is not well-trained. You might have to jerk a little bit. You might have to put that in its mouth and, and cause it some pain to get it to yield, to get it to listen, to get it to, to break its stubbornness. You don't want to go that way. Right. Listen, none of us want to, want to go that way. Tomorrow. Yeah, we can live with it again. It's fine. Everything's fine. We'll, we'll do it tomorrow. Mm. It's so silly. Amen. Just to prove that we have, you know, resolved just to prove that we won't relinquish control. We're willing to struggle another night. You're willing to hold, you're going to go home tonight. You're going to hold on to that grudge, that bitterness, that sin, that unconfessed thing, whatever. You're going to hold on to it another night just because just just cause the preacher said let it go. Just because you want, you want to have that last little bit of grit and that last little bit of resolve and that last little bit of control. What are you doing? Right. What are you doing with those things? It's a control thing. Are we yielded? Oh, if we could only yield as good as we did when we were lost. Turn back to Exodus 7. Why is it so hard to let go? Number one, it's a control thing. Mm -hmm. Number two, it's a small thing. It's a small thing. What do I mean by that? Exodus chapter 7 and verse number 10 the Bible says, Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. It's a small thing. I read a passage like this, and I don't believe that Pharaoh was 
really convinced that things were as bad as they were. Right. I still, I, I read the, these verses here and I still hear Yul Brenner's voice saying, cheap magician's trick. <laughs> um, you know, as Pharaoh watches his magicians be able to do that, and then he, he look at Moses and Aaron and say, this isn't a big deal. This isn't impressive. You know, you've come here in the word of your Lord. My guys can do the same thing. This isn't a big deal. As Aaron, and, as, as Aaron throws his rod down and Pharaoh's magicians do the same, I don't think that he was ever convinced that this was such a big deal. Look at chapter 7, verse 22. After some water was turned into blood, it says in verse 22, And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said. Pharaoh's servants, Pharaoh's magicians, they can make, they can turn water into blood too. Now obviously you know one thing they can't do is turn blood back into water. Right. But it goes to show that Pharaoh looked and could see this isn't a big deal. This isn't anything that anybody else can already do. This isn't impressive. This doesn't seem like it comes with much authority. This really isn't a big deal. And this is why it says in verse 23, and Pharaoh turned and went into his house. Neither did he set his heart to this also. Mm. Now after what he has just seen, the Bible could say these words. Pharaoh turned back around and he went in his house and he didn't even think about it. Right. What he had just seen, he had just seen a plague. He had just seen the Nile River turned into blood. And he could turn around and walk back into his house. And the Bible says he didn't even set his heart to it. It didn't bother him a minute after he turned around and went back home. It's a small, you know why it's hard to let go? It's a small thing, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. it's just a small thing. It's not really a big deal. Do we find that? Do we find that it's hard to let go because we're convinced that it's not really, it's not really that big a deal? We hold on to things in this world. I've mentioned several, but yours may be different. Pride, strife, anger, ill will, bitterness. Attitudes, addictions, unconfessed sins. And you know as well as I do, there have been times you, you've come into God's house and you've heard, you've heard the preacher preach and you've heard God's word proclaimed. And you know that what's being said is right. You hear and you see and recognize there's a wedge in your fellowship. Is it possible though that there's some times, maybe even tonight, we're just going to go home and, and be like Pharaoh where it says, and they didn't set their heart to it. Right. We didn't set our heart to it. That's why we struggle with having revival. And so because we can see, we can hear, we hear God's word all the time. And then never set our heart to it. Mm -hmm. And it does, just like it didn't last fair the time it took him to turn around tonight, we'll go home. You got work tomorrow, you got plans, you got big things coming up in the next week. You, and, you, and we just don't set our heart to it. It's just not that big a deal. Verse 24 here, it says, and all the Egyptians digged round about the river for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the river. See, see, things aren't as bad as they could be. That's the other thing, right? That's why it's not a big deal. See, the Nile was turned into blood, but even the Egyptians, they were able to dig around the river's bank and find some water they could drink. See, things aren't really as bad as they could be. Like muddy water is better than bloody. Things are bad. Come Amen. on, Pharaoh. How, how can he not see it? How can he literally turn around? And the Bible says he didn't even think about it after that. He could turn around and not set his heart to it. Things aren't as bad as they could be. It's not a big deal. I'm not going to worry about this right now. But of a truth, if our walk with the Lord is hindered, isn't that a big deal? Amen. Isn't that big? Isn't that big for Christians? If you're here today and you're lost, you know what the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter six, uh, 16, verse 20, is this that I boredom is a small matter? You think these things are small? You think living, you know, for the lost person, you think that sin, you think that's not a big deal? You think that's a small matter for Christians that don't live in fellowship with Christ, that aren't walking according to the Lord's, the Lord's word? You don't think those are big things? You don't think that's a big deal? You know, I, I get it, right? I understand that, that a wedge of gold and a Babylonish garment don't seem like a big deal. Those aren't big deals, right? 
until 30 midnight. Right. And until it's on your head and on your shoulders for what you've done. Amen. Why, why is it so hard to let go? It's because I think a lot of times we've convinced ourselves it's not really that big a deal. It's just a little thing. In Mark chapter 9. Christ gave instructions. If we're not willing to let go, here's how big a deal Christ said it was. Mark 9 and verse 43, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. Mm. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Yeah. If holding on to that thing is going to keep you from the Lord, yeah. you'd be better off to cut your arm off, he says. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now listen, that means that there comes times for us that there may have to be some hard decisions in your life. You see, I'm up here and I'm making it sound easy, right? I'll just let it go. No. It may not always be that easy. Mm -hmm. There may come a time where you, you're, 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 your grab on something in this world is so tight. And the only, the only remedy for you is to cut that thing off. Mm. I know that's not easy. And I'm not even going to pretend that it is. But Jesus said, the results of living with that hand and what you've got in it is worse than if you just cut it off. Mm -hmm. Deal with the pain of getting that thing fixed or else hold on to it and then live with those results. Is what you're holding on to really worth keeping you from the Lord? Mm -hmm. This thing that you won't let go of, what I'm holding on to my, I mean, I mentioned it at the beginning, right? My, my tip pegs are, are deep. I've got such a firm grip in this world. I love the things of this world so much. I tell you what, it's been a long time since any of us could probably say, you know, that we've ever been in a spot where we were really satisfied and content and happy with our relationship with the Lord right. and how close we were with Him. You know, our love of the world is so great. I mean, we've just got such a grasp on it, such a hold on it. Right. Christ said, if you, if you can't get it out of your hand, then just cut it off. Take the other hand at least and lock that thing off because you holding on to it is going to cause you a whole lot more pain in this life and potentially in the next. Holding on to that thing and not letting go is going to cause you ultimately a whole lot more pain than the pain of cutting your hand off. Right. I've never had that. Some have. They know the pain. Jesus said, that pain's nothing to compare to if you won't let that thing go. Amen. What are you holding on to that's keeping you from the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it worth it? You're not happy. You're not serving. You're not living. You're miserable. And you're making everyone miserable around you. You're bitter. You're angry. You're unhappy. Why don't we let, why don't we let go? It's a little thing. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh was never convinced that things were as bad as they were. And it was falling apart around him. And you may be here today and others can see it in your life. Things are falling apart. And you, you don't see it. And you don't see it because you just won't let go. Number three. And this is where we're at. It's a hardness thing. You're right. In Exodus chapter 8. It's a control thing. It's a small thing. But ultimately, it's a hardness thing. Exodus 8 and verse 15, the Bible says, When Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Look at verse 19. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the favor of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Verse 32, it says, And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. Chapter 9, verse 7, And Pharaoh said, Behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. 
And then in verse 34 of chapter 9 it says, And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants. The longer he goes, the more angry he gets. And the colder he gets, and the harder he gets. Right. You know, at one point, his magicians confessed, we're not able to keep up with this, Pharaoh. This is the finger of the God. And instead of it turning him to the Lord, it made him more mad. Mm -hmm. And then one day he went out and he saw that all of his cattle were dead. And he looked over and saw that all the cattle of the Israelites were still alive. And that didn't soften him. It made him more mad. Mm -hmm. And then he went out one day and he saw that there was thunder, there was lightning, and there was hail, and there was fire. And then just like that, it was gone. And Pharaoh realized this God and this Moses, they just turned these plagues on and off like a switch. And that made him mad. Mm -hmm. And all of these things that we would see could have and should have softened him and made him see the error of his ways and made him repent, made him get right, and made him listen, all of those things just made him mad. Mm -hmm. Made him more angry, more cold, and more hard. The longer he goes, the harder he gets. Now listen, you and I are not above that happening to us. You're right. We are not above getting cold, crusty, and hard. Unwilling to listen. Unwilling to hear. We're not above that. I can see it in me. The longer I go, the colder I get, the harder I get. You know, the more annoying, the more annoying I become, the more, more impatient I am at home, the my relationship with my wife and with my children suffer. I'm not nearly what I ought to be in my home. I'm not nearly what I ought to be at work. I'm not nearly what I ought to be as a man, period. And all because I'm too stubborn and I'm willing to yield, submit, and let go. Mm -hmm. I see it in me. Even his magicians couldn't persuade him. And it went so long that everyone suffered. And listen, it went so long with Pharaoh that it cost him his own son. Mm -hmm. And it cost everybody in Egypt a son. An unwillingness to yield, an unwillingness to listen, just getting harder and harder and harder had drastic effects. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Plain lessons, right? You've seen it in yourself, just like I've seen it in me. Um, you realize that if you don't go, if you don't read your Bible tomorrow, it'll be easier not to read it Wednesday, right? And if you don't read it this week, it'll be easier not to read it next week. And if you miss time praying and seeking the Lord, it's going to be easier to do it next time. You know what that is? That's getting harder. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's as time progresses, getting harder and harder and harder. And, and listen, sometimes the rough edges got to be knocked off. We get crusty at times. We get hard, yeah. and we got to we got to have those things chipped off and knocked off. Ephesians four verse seventeen says it this way: This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye walk, or that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over into lasciviousness mm -hmm. to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. Mm -hmm. What it says there about Gentiles who being past feeling, he says, you didn't learn that in Christ. Right. And yet we see it sometimes in ourselves. We, we feel that stuff creeping in that... Things that used to bother you don't bother you anymore. Things that, I, that used to bug me don't bug me as much as they did anymore, right? Now, we're not completely con, right? You know, but it don't bug us the way that it used to. Right. And if I don't pray on Tuesday, it, it doesn't bug me near as much on Wednesday when I don't. And if I'm not right with the Lord on Thursday, by the time Sunday rolls around, that's not nearly as a big a deal as it used the longer I go and the harder I get, the crustier I get in that. And I start to get to a point where I get past feeling and things aren't bothering me the way that they used to. And he said, you didn't learn that in Christ. Amen. You have not so learned Christ. 
That's, that's a Gentile talking. That's that old man talking. These Gentiles who are past feeling and they've given themselves over to lasciviousness and all of those things that it says, that's not what you learned in Christ. You see, in Christ and in having the Spirit of God in us, there should be a tenderness. There should be a softness Amen. in us that's willing to listen and to yield to what He says and what He commands. Greater is He that is in us than He that is in the world. Amen. In us, we have the Holy Spirit of God who we have potential and ability as Christians to walk with the Lord, to have a relationship with Christ, to be soft, to be tender. And I look at me, and I look in the mirror each day, and there's days that I look at I'm so hard. Mm -hmm. Things aren't bothering me. You know what it is? Sometimes it's a control thing. And there's times I've convinced myself that it's a small thing. Yeah. But nine times out of ten, I've just grown hard and cold. And the things that used to bother me don't seem to bother me anymore. You didn't, you didn't learn that in Christ. Right. You've not so learned Christ. Should we as Christians ever get to the point where things don't bother us? Where hindrances don't worry us? So what do we do? Put some things off. What is there tonight that you keep that you're, you're holding on to? Is it this world? Is there some unconfessed sin? I mean, is there something you're doing at home you shouldn't be doing? Is there, is there a relationship that you're involved in right now that you shouldn't be involved in or that you need to, you know, rein it back? Is there some kind of bitterness or ill will? You know, this is this, you know, we got a small group here tonight. It doesn't have to be a group this size that maybe somebody on this side of the room looks at the other side and can't stand them. Right. Holding grudges, mad, mm -hmm. angry. What are we so angry about? What is it tonight that we've held on to and that for all our strength and all of our grit, we're not going to yield and not yield to Christ? We'll never have revival. We'll never have a close fellowship and walk with the Lord until we're willing to take these hands and open them up in His service. Amen. All of those things that I'm holding on to in this world, all of those things that I love and I'm not willing to let go of, it's hurting me. It's hurting me bad. Why is it so hard to let go? Tonight, would you ask yourself honestly what you're holding on to? And would you add, honestly ask yourself, is, has it been worth it? Can you honestly say that it's been worth it? Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to come into your house tonight. And, uh, and I pray, Lord, that as we open this week and we take a look at some things this week, that you, your spirit would be pleased to, to visit amongst us, to, to take our minds and our hearts and turn them back to, what they, to where they ought to be. Help us to think about things that we ought to think about, those things that are true, those things that are right, those things that are pure and lovely and a good report. Lord, help us to, to think about the things that we're supposed to think about. And, and whatever it is tonight, We, we are so dove deep in this world, Lord. We've, there are times that we forget what it's like to really walk close to you. And this pulpit's not any higher than the pew. And Lord, I'm, I'm as guilty and weak and as frail as any. And help us, Lord, to turn loose and to let go. And help us to realize things that we're holding on to in this world. They're not worth it. It's not been worth it to walk away from you. It's not been worth it to hinder our relationship. And for the lost person that's here tonight, Lord, uh, what they're holding on to and an unwillingness to come to Christ, an unwillingness to get on their face and repent of their sins yes, and trust Lord. Christ, uh, Lord, that they'd be better off to cut that arm off mm -hmm. um, than to not come before you and just bear it all and confess before you that everything they've held on to can't save them anyway. I pray, Lord, this week that if you give, that you give forgiveness to sinners, or cause them to see the light, and cause yes, them to Lord. see the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ who died. And most importantly, Lord, for those here today that are Christians and that are seeking revival this week and in our lives, Lord, that you help us to, to give the reins over to you. And then this week, just show us where we really are. Just show us who we really are and help this be the start to get us back on the right track. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.